Hello wonderful people, welcome back to Cosmology Talks. This is another talk in the Camel series. This one is by Jay Wadika, who is a postdoc at Princeton. As this is part of a series, there's no intro to camels. If you want an intro, there should be one being advertised on the screen right now, or if not, there's one in the description. Jay is talking about using machine learning and camels to better measure the masses of galaxy clusters to get better scaling relations. Galaxy clusters are super helpful cosmology probes on the small scales and the nonlinear scales. We, we actually mentioned in the talk that cluster mass measurements were hinting at both dark matter and dark energy quite a bit of time before they became completely well-established parts of the cosmological model. So better methods to measure cluster masses is definitely a really good thing for cosmology. And also, as with other camel stuff, what I really like about Jay's work is that he and his collaborators don't just stop at neural network does better, but they really do try to understand the physics behind what is going on, what the neural network has seen. So enjoy. Welcome to Cosmology Talks, Jay. Do you want to start by telling us briefly about your work? Hi, Sean. Thanks for organizing this. I'll be talking about some work with people here, which you have just posted to archive. So I will be talking about uh, using machine learning to augment astrophysical scaling relations. Scaling relations are used in many areas of cosmology and astrophysics. And machine learning can help us make the existing scaling relations more accurate or improve their domain of validity. So that is the first takeaway point that I wanted to mention. And the second would be that we have found a new way to estimate cluster masses, combining information from SZ, Sunyav Zeldovich, and X-ray surveys, and showed that our estimate of cluster masses is more accurate than what has been previously found with scaling relations. Cool. So yeah, what, what questions were you trying to answer? Why is each question important to solve and what do we gain by solving them? So mass estimation of galaxy clusters is important for cosmology. First of all, galaxy clusters have like 10 to hundreds of galaxies. They are like one of the biggest like objects in the universe. And their abundance uh, as a function of their mass is a very sensitive probe of cosmology. For example, I've shown two cases here where you have different cosmologies having very different cluster abundances where you normalize it to redshift zero and then you can see that the evolution is very different for different redshifts or different cosmologies. And here is a recent plot from one of the recent surveys, SPT, with constraints from cluster cosmology. One interesting fact is clusters were actually used for one of the first observational uh, predictions of dark matter by uh, Fritz Zwicky, who called it uh, Dunkle Materie. Cluster masses was also something that was hinting at lambda before lambda got detected, right? Like people were measuring the masses and only getting omega matter equals 0.3 and thinking what's going on. And it was... Right, right. Yeah. They have a, a rich history going back to like many decades in cosmology. I guess the point about this plot in the top right hand corner is that the blue one is cluster cosmology. And then is, is the red one like weak lensing cosmology and the yellow one weak lensing. So you're, you're sort of showing that cluster cosmology is competitive with, with them or are all of them cluster? Uh, no, only the green and the blue are cluster cosmology and others are weak lensing and Planck. So then let me go into like giving an overview of the machine learning approaches that we used. So I've shown here uh, different machine learning techniques along two dimensions. You have uh, deep neural networks, which are very powerful. They can work on like input data with large dimensionality or a large data size, for example, high resolution images, but then they are like very hard to interpret or their results are like sometimes hard to generalize beyond the training set. On the other side is this machine learning algorithm called symbolic regression. It can work only on like small data sets. For example, each data point can have 10 parameters and you can have like less than 10,000 data points. But then it can produce equations which can be readily interpretable and generalizable, which I'll talk about. So I just thought of like giving a very, very quick overview of how symbolic regression works. So if you have a very like simple like toy 2D data, if you give like a data file to symbolic regression, what it does is it tries to search the space of functions to try to come up with the best function which can fit these data. So for example, it tries cosine, does not work, tries a linear function, which is close. So then it keeps iterating on this linear function and then it finds an equation which fits quite well. So this is a very simple uh, like 2D example. You might say that I could have also guessed a function similar to this, but then symbolic regression becomes very important when you go to high dimensions where you cannot uh, visualize a high dimensional hypersurface easily, but then using symbolic regression, you can find what equations encode this hypersurface. Oh, you can also restrict like the space of functions it looks, looks at. Like if, if you have a hunch that it might be a polynomial or a hunch that it might be sinusoidal, 
because what one of the things I think I've heard before that is a bit of a problem with symbolic regression is it might just spit out some formula that is just completely unphysical, and if you went even slightly outside of the the range that it was trained on, it would do silly stuff. But I guess if you limit what it can look at to things that you expect might be physical. Right, right. I also think it's very useful that you can get some very useful feedback from it. Maybe it may not give you the final answer, which uh, you might expect, but then you can get some feedback and then you can use the knowledge that you have, the domain knowledge to then come up with an even better answer. So I use it. I, I think of this method as like it can give you useful feedback and not maybe not give you the final answer right away. So then, yeah, let me go like jump straight in where we use symbolic regression in our problem. We observe clusters in many different wavelengths and the traditional way of estimating masses of clusters is to take like one observable from these surveys. For example, in, in the CMB surveys, due to the thermal sunev zildovich effect, you can actually measure the total amount of like thermal energy in the cluster, which uh, people call it as YCMB. And we know from Virial theorem that it is proportional to the mass of the cluster. It follows a simple power law with a small scatter. And so this is how we infer uh, like cluster masses. And one thing to note here is like there is scatter in this relationship. The smaller the scatter, the more accurate your mass estimation is. And uh, this is where we try to like improve upon the previous method by trying to see whether you can augment this observable from CMB surveys with observables from some other surveys for example, uh, properties in X-ray surveys or uh, galaxy surveys. But our motivation was there could be complementary information which can be hidden in, in some of these parameters which can then be added to uh, the, the thing we measure from CMB surveys and give us a more accurate uh, prediction. And the reason why using machine learning techniques here is useful is that there are a lot, lot of parameters which you don't know like what parameters enter this equation. You also don't know what functional forms to combine these parameters with the original YCMB with. So in cases like these, I think you can use symbolic regression to search these high dimensional space. The super nasty thing I would imagine here, if you're trying to do it without machine learning, is also worrying about covariance because a lot of these probes are different observational probes of kind of in the background, the same fundamental physics, like the, the temperature or something like that. And so then, yeah, developing some sort of optimal statistic without letting a machine do it for you would require understanding a heck of a lot of what's going on under the tins. And one, one way people have traditionally done is, is like looking at a lot of 2D plots to see whether you can like identify a high dimensional surface. But once you go to high dimensions, like a lot, lot of dimensions, this approach becomes quite tedious. So then we did not like directly use symbolic regression here. We used a decision tree based approach called random forest, which is a lot faster to train. And what we tried to do first is we tried to identify which of these parameters are even important. And we found that the stellar mass was like giving us a good prediction. So then we went a step ahead and uh, used symbolic regression on these parameters to see what we get. I'm going to ask this at some point and I, I have to, I can't hold myself back. This is the last of the, the talks that we're recording. A lot of your colleagues have sort of said one of the problems for future work is that the boxes in camels are not big enough. There are only 25 megaparsecs across. That must be a problem you've, you've had here as well, right? Like, d does every box even have a galaxy cluster in it? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you, you are right that uh, there are a lot of uh, boxes in camels which do not have a single cluster. So you can, you can probe some of the lower mass ranges. I, I'll talk about this in my next slide. So the first thing we tried to do is we did not use camels. Like in the beginning, we tried to use the Illustris TNG for the reason that you mentioned. Camels has a small volume. Illustris TNG has a much, much larger volume with a large number of clusters. So then we applied symbolic regression on, on these dimensions that I mentioned. And we found actually that you can have a better prediction of mass if you combine this parameter from CMB surveys with a parameter that you can estimate from X-ray surveys which has this form, 1 minus a constant times the concentration of gas. So what this does is it effectively downweights the, the central regions of the clusters, which are more noisy, and it upweights the outskirts of the clusters, which are less noisy. And so I think that's why in the end, uh, it gives a mass prediction, which is like a, a bit more accurate. And you can see the improvement uh, in the bottom panel. We thought it was like a good way of uh, combining like complementary information in these two probes. For example, X-ray has a high resolution like information, but then it's an indirect probe of gas thermal energy. And on the other hand, CMB has a low resolution, but a direct probe. And, and so this one minus A C gas was not something that you or any of your colleagues as a 
I don't know, a sentient human being thought, hey, let's try this formula. It was it was what the symbolic regression told you was. Right, right. Yeah. In in hindsight, now we think like uh, this should be obvious that you should downweight your course and upweight the, the outskirts. But then, yeah, this is like post-processing after we got uh, these equations, then we thought about it more. This seems like exactly the best case scenario of what you want machine learning to do, right? You don't want it to just do cosmology better than you and you have no idea how it's, you know, what it's doing. You want it to spit out a formula like this or a, or a trend or a prediction. And then because of that, we, we look at it and go, huh, why has this happened? And, and we understand cosmology better. I guess the one risk is that you kind of construct these, what are they called? Just so stories where you're like, uh, you explain why it happened with a very compelling story that just turns out to be the wrong compelling story. But yeah, I mean, obviously you can go away and test. Right, right. So we, we did and we went back and we tested, like you can explicitly remove the cores and see how the scatter is. And we got similar improvements. So yeah, we, we did these cross checks later once we, once we had these equations. Yeah. So then one question you were alluding to is about like camel simulations. And uh, so for example, like the, the test we did on Elastis TNG, someone might say that is your result uh, robust with uh, feedback prescriptions? Elastis TNG is using one particular set of feedback prescriptions. So this is where I think camel simulations are quite useful. They have like these different subgrid physics, which I think Paco and other people have mentioned earlier. So we tried our method on these simulations, uh, these camel simba and the camel TNG set. And it, it does seem to have like a similar improvement in both cases. So we could then verify that this method is robust to changes in baryonic feedback. Well, to these specific changes. So yeah, 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 these particular changes. And regarding your point, you can see that it does not probe like the high mass range very well. So we still need some simulations which vary baryonic physics, but then they produce like high mass clusters. So you could start camel simulations with seeds which have like larger uh, objects in them. And that would be one way to try to do this. Do you mean like you, you create a bunch of random seeds and then you, from the initial linear perturbations, go, ah, okay, that's going to turn into a bigger cluster. Let's actually run the full simulation on that one, but not on the, I don't know, 100 that we ran. Uh, right, right. This is one way which people are thinking about. One thing you have to be careful is cosmic variance. Uh, if you ha if you're doing a study which has cosmic variance as uh, one of the things in it, so then you have to be careful picking particular seeds. But then if you're doing an analysis where you are probing feedback, I think this is fine. You can try to pick those seeds and uh, see whether you get these high mass clusters and then you can uh, like use your theoretical techniques and see if those work on those high mass clusters. Yeah, I, I guess by doing that pre-selection, you've got a kind of selection function that's sneaking its way in, which is not the observational selection function. Because observationally, you're also only seeing the things above some flux cut or above some SZ signal, but that's probably not going to correlate to naively what you might do. Right, right. Yeah, okay, that's interesting as well. So other than uh, like reducing scatter in already existing astrophysical scaling relations, uh, one other thing you could do is uh, try to improve the domain of validity. So for example, uh, this, this power law I was showing, I've now zeroed the power law. So you can explicitly see the, the deviation from the power law, which happens when you have uh, low mass clusters. And this happens because you have active galactic nuclei feedback or, or supernova feedback, which just blows up gas out of clusters. And we then try to see whether you can add in uh, some parameters which can then improve like the domain of validity of these uh, cell similar relations. And we saw actually that this ratio M star over M gas actually works quite well. So you can see for both this camel TNG and camel Simba, uh, you get a lot of improvement. And I think the reason is like if you have a lot of uh, gas being converted to stars, that might actually decrease your YCMB. But then if you add this correcting factor, it can then restore this uh, relation. And uh, CAMELS is very useful here because then you can test uh, whether these relations on, on these different simulations with these different parameters, whether they are only like fitting to one particular like set of uh, parameters or they are general. And here we found that they are quite general, like uh, you can have these different cases and it, it did fit quite well. Yeah. And, and just this one plus M star over M gas was again picked by the computer? Uh, so this was actually a combination of uh, two. So here I've not uh, written. So this M star over M gas is actually uh, calculated at the radius, which is around half the virial radius. So what we picked by intuition, we were seeing that actually M star over M gas contributes and we picked like the M star over M gas over the, the full radius. But then we ran a symbolic regression where asking whether you can predict something better. And it said that like you should try to uh, introduce a factor which can have this ratio at half the radius. And that actually works quite better. So, so this is like combination of, I guess, yeah, human intuition and uh, symbolic regression. I guess that's the best kind. So long as it's still a combination is better, we're, we're, still, uh, we're still useful to the machines. 
So, so what should we take away from this work? How, how should we update our beliefs about cosmology and what should we be doing or looking into differently now that your work is out there? So I think like one of the takeaways is you can use like machine learning tools like uh, symbolic regression to augment astrophysical scaling relations, which are important for uh, doing a bunch of things in cosmology, for estimating like masses of galaxy clusters or estimating uh, distances to supernovae or sea feeds. You also use like some scaling relations. So we can maybe use machine learning tools and increase their precision. And the other takeaway I think I would want to like give is compared to a manual analysis, I think machine learning tools are much faster and more robust when it comes to extracting uh, low scatter relations in abstract high dimensional spaces. So I got distracted you talking about supernovae and thinking about the H naught tension, but I guess they, they only have 20, um, 20 local supernovae that they can calibrate with. So it's probably not enough to do machine learning on 20 data points. It's probably too small. Right, right. So this actually brings me to like the final point. I think what you might ask is uh, uh, like what keeps me up at night or what I would like to talk with other experts. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've been thinking actually of whether like these techniques could be useful for other areas where you use like some simplistic relations which work pretty well, but then you might want to increase their accuracy a bit more. So for example, for creating mocks, people use this assumption that uh, the number of galaxies of, is a function of only the halo mass. But then it could also be a function of other uh, secondary properties, for example, concentration, environment. And so we tried to use uh, symbolic regression on, on these problems. And we got like some equations which we thought were interesting. I won't go into detail in these. So other things which I'm like thinking about is like, yeah, can you uh, go to other uh, scaling relations to identify some augmentations to already existing relations. And so I, I've just listed here some of the popular relations in, that are used. So yeah, this is like one thing I would like, like to like talk to other experts where it could be used in, in problems. I guess the Cepheid period luminosity relation would be something where there's enough data because there are enough Cepheids, there just aren't enough Cepheids and supernovae in the same galaxy. Yeah, if you have like data sets which are public and which which one could use like these algorithms, yeah, it, it would be good to like see augmentations on on these relations and see if we can find something yeah, more accurate. And here I'm just showing like one of the examples where people have looked at these things in traditional ways. And I think like this is a bit uh, tedious. So now if you have like a four dimensional space, you are looking at like two dimensions at a time and trying to fit functions there. I think like symbolic regression or decision tree algorithms are faster and sometimes like they can give you these relations which might be interesting. There are also other things that are used in like analysis of galaxies where you have like things like Tully Fisher or a black hole bulge mass or fundamental plane. And I think here also it, it might be useful to think of these techniques. Cluster masses was just one example, but I think these are general techniques and people could try it on their data sets. Yeah, you have to start somewhere and show the proof of concept, which I guess you've, you've done very well. Cool. Well, thanks, Jay, for the great work and great talk. Thanks a lot, Sean, for making this happen. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. There will be a live discussion of all the Camels talks in this series, probably sometime in February or March. All the speakers will be present, as will other invited experts on adjacent topics. So get in touch if you're interested in, in being in a mailing list to be informed of that and other mini workshops associated to other cosmology talks. If you want more uh, more awesome Camels talks, there's a playlist in the description and there should be a video being advertised on the screen now or soon. Another option could be to watch Alexi Leato and Song Huang's talk, which was about observationally measuring cluster masses. Hopefully sometime soon, people like Alexi and Song will be using the techniques that people like Jay are discovering. In the meantime, if you like this, don't forget to like and subscribe so that YouTube knows to share more similar stuff with you in the future and have a great day.